The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus instructed the twelve as follows. Do not be afraid. For everything that is now covered will be uncovered. And everything now hidden will be made clear. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the daylight. What you hear in whispers, proclaim it from the housetops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear him rather, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Can you not buy two sparrows for a penny? And yet, not one falls to the ground without your father knowing? Why, every hair on your head has been counted. So there is no need to be afraid. You are worth more than hundreds of sparrows. So if anyone declares himself for me in the presence of men, I will declare myself for him in the presence of my Father in heaven. But the one who disowns me in the presence of men, I will disown in the presence of my Father in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I must confess my distraction. Everything now covered must be uncovered. <laughs> a day will come when you will uncover that mask from your face and be in public. That day will come. Everything covered, one day it will be uncovered. Our reading today is a, a very profound, provocative reading. It's, it's speaking to the twelve. The Gospel of Matthew has five discourses. And the first of those discourses is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the second. It's called the Mission Discourse. It's, it's Jesus missioning his 12 disciples. And, and in missioning the 12, he is, is sending them out on mission, but he is making them into missionaries at the same time. And, and the text, and I, I would invite you to go back when you reach home dust the bible off open it up look for matthew look for chapter 10 and read the whole of matthew chapter 10 and you'll see he starts by naming those that will be missioned and then he gives a number of instructions and this is the last set of instructions to those that will be missioned and you you might already make the connection because you know what we're doing in the church these days you all know what are we doing we are missioning the domestic church. We're missioning the domestic church. We are, we are helping the domestic church first to find its identity, which is what Jesus does in that chapter. First to find their identity as, as those who belong to him. Then through their identity to understand their mission and then to go out on mission and be part of the mission that God had entrusted to Jesus Christ himself. And, and the process of missioning is what chapter 10 of Matthew is about. And, and that's what we're going to reflect on today because it, it's such a powerful text. So he starts by saying to them, do not be afraid. You know, three times in the text he says, don't be afraid. You, 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 you gain any clues as yet? Yeah? What, what, what is the most fearful thing that God could ask you? To go to Africa on mission or go to your family on mission? Which one more fearful? <laughs> eh? you, 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 if you say Africa, you're gone tomorrow morning. The, the, the toughest mission that there is right now is a mission to your own family. That, that's the hardest mission that there is. And, and it's the one that most people are terrified about. And, and, and when you think of it, the, the capacity of, of our young to push back hard is so great. They're expert in pushing back. Am I wrong? No. Eh? They, they, they have doctoral degrees in pushing back before they're five years old. They know how to do it. 
And, and whereas we lived in a time 30, 50 years ago where we had the illusion that we were living in a culture that was basically Christian, we're living in a time today where we do not have that illusion. We're not living in a Christian culture. The, the values of the, of the kingdom of God are actually looked at as suspect, as, as somehow esoteric, as somehow naive, as somehow um, even bigotry, as, as there, there's so many ways in which the values of the kingdom are being portrayed in our world today that, that even for, to hold those values and to hold them up is so difficult in this time in which we live. And that's what is being addressed in the text because it was the same thing in the time of Jesus. The values of the kingdom were not being accepted readily. Matthew writes his gospel at a time when the Jews had expelled the Christians from the, from the synagogue and, and where the world had become hostile to the Christians. And, and that is the same context in which we are living right now. And that's why missioning the domestic church is not the easiest prospect. It's one of the most difficult challenges, but it is why it is the challenge that you and I have to take up and the challenge that the whole church has to take up. Why take on something easy? Anybody could do that. Huh? If it's easy, let easy people do it. But, but if it is a real challenge, then that, that warrants our attention and it warrants our, our energy. It warrants our prayer. It warrants our life. So when Jesus says everything that is now covered will be uncovered and everything now hidden will be made clear, what I say to you in the dark, go and tell it in the daylight. And what you hear in whispers, proclaim from the housetops. What he's speaking to there is the truth of the gospel message. That in that time, the people would not have believed the gospel to be true. How can you speak about a God of mercy and love? How can you speak about a God of unconditional love? How can you speak about that? How can you speak about a God that is this intimate and this connected into our daily reality? How can we speak about that? What Jesus is saying is, if you've heard it in the, in the whispers, go to the house stops and start proclaiming it. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And, and here's the first test of the, of the, of the disciple. And the missioning process, do you believe the truth that God has revealed in Jesus Christ? That, that's the first thing. Because if you don't believe the truth, you can't proclaim it. If you don't believe it, you can't proclaim it. Do you believe the truth that God has revealed in Jesus Christ? And, and that's, that's what this text is about. Because what you heard will be now proclaimed on the rooftop. What was done in, in, in secret will be made, made bare. And what he's speaking to here is the truth of the gospel that the whole world will see that the gospel message is the only way to salvation, to hope, to life, and to give people life. It is the only way. There is no other way outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the other ways are partial ways that hold parts of the truth and parts of the life and parts of the love that the gospel holds. The gospel alone in its entirety holds the whole together and gives the whole a reason for being. And that's the truth. That is the truth. But the problem that we face today is that many Christians don't even know what the gospel teach. I'm not even sure if they really believe. Am I wrong? Help me now. Help me. So the first obligation the Christian has is to know what the gospel teaches. What was handed to us by the apostles. That means that you and I have to be studying our faith. We have to understand it. You ask Mr. Google all kind of questions about cooking and running and health and fitness and, and this and that and the next and the other. When last did you ask Mr. Google a question about the gospel, about the truth of the teaching of the church, about some area of church life and, and the doctrine of the church? When last you asked Mr. Google a question? Huh? When last? We, we have the tools in our hands. We have so many great sites and so many great, great places, catholicanswers.org, 
Bank.com or, or, or Robert Barron or so many places. My article is in the, in the back of the Catholic News every single week. I, I try to expose what the church is teaching on the issues of the day. Are you reading? Are you keeping up? And you don't have to read. You could look at Shepherd Corn and take it in in video if you don't like reading. But the first thing we have to do is we have to know what the church is teaching. First. And when we know what it is teaching, we must not be afraid of it. And you have to start by believing that the church has a great answer for every human question that exists. You have to believe that. And then you have to go to find that. And you have to find it from credible sources so that you know that what you find you can trust. And when we, we start by that foundation of knowing what the church is teaching, ah, then we could go to the next stage. And in the next stage of the text, he says, each stage starts with don't be afraid, you know. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Fear him rather who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. What do we fear most? In this age in which we live, what do we fear most? We fear not being liked. Not so? And, and this fear of not being liked has been the ruin of parenthood. It's been the ruin of parents. Parents somehow get the impression that they have to be the best friends of their children. That's not your job. Your job is not to be their best friend. That's not your job. That's not in the job description of a parent. The parent is there to, to, to nurture and to guard. Not to be a best friend. If they happen to be a best friend, that's nice. But that's not the job description. Your first job is to say to your kids what the truth of the gospel is and to do it not by your words, but first by your example. That's your first job. To give to them what is most precious. And what is most precious is not this human thing that we have here which is incredibly beautiful, wonderful, amazing and fantastic but this is pale in comparison to the true treasure which is life with God in eternity. And that's what Jesus speaks to here. That, that what we have here is a text that is saying to us, don't worry if they don't like you. Don't even worry if they unfriend you. Don't worry if they unfriend you. Don't worry if they go and talk you bad to all their friends. Don't even worry if they put you up on Facebook and, 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 and say all kind of bad foolish things about you. That is not your worry. Your worry is about the one who not only could unfriend you, but when he unfriend you, you're well unfriended. You're well unfriended. What, what Jesus is playing with here is the Old Testament concept of the fear of the Lord. And the wisdom literature says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is not fear in the sense of horror, but fear in the sense of both horror and love. Because if you've ever come into an experience and an encounter with the living God, the, the, the first thing God says to you is, do not be afraid. And there's a very, very, very good reason for God to say, do not be afraid, you know. When Mary received the angel, the first thing the angel said is, do not be afraid, Mary. Do not, why? Because when we come into the face of the living God, we are terrified because our ego knows that it is not center. Our ego understands that it cannot survive. Our ego understands that it is a sham and a lie because it is now in the face of the ultimate and, and the, the, the full authority that exists. And our little ego understands it must die because it is God and God alone that can be the center of the universe. Not me. Not my ego, not my pride, not my willfulness, not the things I want. And, and when we come in the face of, the, the, of God, what, what we experience is a dying of the ego. And it is terrifying for many. And that's why the spiritual journey is, is so hard for so many people. And he's saying, he's giving us a value system. And you have to hear the value system. 
Do not be afraid of those who can do you harm in this world, who can unfriend you, who could dislike you, who could talk you bad, who could even kill your body. Don't afraid them, you know. Don't afraid them. Because all they could do has a, has a, 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 is shorten your life by at the most 90 years. At the absolute most, they could shorten your life by 90 years. That's the most they could do. Fear rather him who could shorten or lengthen your eternity in the, in the fires of Gehenna. Gehenna was that place where all the idol worship happened. Where, where all the idolatry and the sensuality and, and the lust and, and, and all of that happened. And it was turned into a fiery pit where that never went out. And that became the image for Israel of, of what hell is for us. Fear him who having killed your body could take your soul into hell forever. And, and that is saying that there is a value system of, of, that is not an equal value system. The value of being liked by this world is, is foolish in comparison to the value of being a friend of God. There are two totally different levels. And if you miss up that level, you don't understand life. It's, it's, it's like going after a hundred dollar bill rather than, than, than a million dollar that somebody has for you that you, that, that you can't see. It's like, it's like going after what, it, what is pale in comparison to what has ultimate value. What Jesus is putting is a value proposition. What you want to go for, the short term likes from, from your family, your, your children, from Facebook, from your friends, that you are hip, you are hop, you are nice, you are sweet, you are cuddly, you are cute, you are best friend. That's what you want to go for? Or you want to go for the real value of being a disciple of Jesus Christ who does what is right, lives what is right, is unafraid of those who will criticize you because you know where your true value is. It is with God in heaven. That's where it is. But we've been living this kind of paltry, kind of foolish life, trying to be liked by the people of the world, rather than putting our life in the hands of God and, and, and being liked by God. It's not about friendship. It's really not about friendship here on earth. It is ultimately about God's friendship. And after that, everything else falls into line. And to, 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 to make the point even bigger, he says, you know, you worry about what? We you worried, you worried about a, a, a little sparrow. The, the, the cheapest thing you could buy in the market was a sparrow. A little farthing for a sparrow. A little sparrow, you know, is the cheapest thing. And yet, God knows the sparrow. God knows the sparrow when it lives and when it dies. How much more are you valuable to God? So it's a value proposition again. The sparrow versus your life. The value of the sparrow and the value of your life. Are you not worth more than hundreds of sparrows? In other words, you are so much more important to God than the sparrow. And God is concerned for the sparrow. How much more is God concerned for you and for your life? And if we get this one point, brothers and sisters, the rest of the discipling is, is really easy. That God is concerned for you. That's it. That's the centerpiece of this discipleship text. God is concerned for you. God loves you. And God is, is concerned for everything that happens in your life. So do not be afraid. You know the Bible has do not be afraid 365 times. You know that? One for every day in the year and a leap year. Hold your breath. <laughs> hold your breath on the leap year. And, and there's a good reason because we human beings are afraid. And when we hear missioning the domestic church, it puts us into fear. Because, because we, we can't see how that could happen. But, but I am saying to you that the Spirit will do more in us than we could imagine at this moment. And if we do what we are supposed to do, 10 years from now we will look back and see a renewal not only of our families but of our church, our parishes, our ecclesial communities, our schools, and this nation of Trinidad and Tobago. We will see that. He goes on from there and says, anyone who declares himself in my presence, in the presence of men, 
I will declare myself for him in the presence of my Father in heaven. Again, another value proposition. Who your real friend is? You want, you, you want your children to like you on Facebook? Or you want God to like you in the book of eternal life? Which book you want to get like in? What book you want to get like in? Tell me now. Eh? Because if Facebook like, today they like and tomorrow they're telling you it's your worst mother or father in the, in the whole world. Not so? They like you when, they, when you do what they like. And when you do what they don't like, they, they unlike you. But when you're liked in the book of eternal life, you're liked for life, for death, and for eternity. Make your choice. There's a value proposition before us, and we have to choose whether we're going to go for what is temporary or what is eternal. And that's what Jesus is putting before us. Today's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to every father here in this congregation. Yeah, we could give them a round of applause. What happened, woman? Eh? We could give them a round of applause. Fathers, you know that we haven't done our job well. Eh? You know that. Come on, let me be honest now. You know we haven't done our, our job well. You know we've left the parenting to the mothers for the most part. For the most part. And the father who has been actively parenting is really a great exception, but not the norm in our nation. And that's what has to change. In, in the book of Genesis, God said to Adam, I put you in the middle of the garden to till and to guard, to nurture and to guard. And that's the role of the father, to nurture, to be emotionally available to the child and to the family, to be present emotionally and nurture it like the way a farmer will nurture a plant, giving it everything it needs in, in good time but also to God, to ensure that evil and the hostile, the weeds, don't come and encroach and, and snuffle out that plant. When the father is not present, there's a kind of nurturing that, that a family needs that, that it can't have. Mom can do an incredible job as mom, but it takes a woman to be a mother, and it takes a man to be a father. And a man can't be a mother, and a woman can't be a father. Because they bring different gifts to the family. And a child that grows up without a father who is nurturing and guarding, you see the behavior of that child, and you see all the challenges that that child holds. You see it. Men, we have a sacred obligation from God to nurture and to guard. Not to dominate, not to subdue not to be head honcho, not to be macho. None of that is in the text. To nurture and to guard. And my prayer on this day of Father's Day is that if the men of this nation and the men of the Catholic Church would make this journey towards fatherhood, then the missioning of the domestic church would become a prospect that would be a lot easier than it seems right now. And so I pray for all the fathers that through God's grace and God's blessings, that they will find the courage to do what, what has been asked of them and to live what God is asking. Amen.